Hello and welcome to AWC's recorded presentation, Seeing the Forest for the Trees, Carbon Benefits of Wood Products. Today's engineer, engineering host is Lori Cook, Director of Education Outreach, and our special guests are Ethan Breitling, Creative and Communications Director for the National Alliance of Forest Owners, Edie Sonny Hall, Founder of Three Trees Consulting, and Jane Alonso, Consultant for Alum. Alonso Strategic Consulting. Here's just a quick disclaimer. Note that this webinar and associated slides should not be used as a substitute for competent engineering support and expertise. This presentation is approved by American Institute of Architects. This presentation is a copyrighted. And now you've also likely seen this description already, so we're not gonna spend any time covering this, but hopefully you are here for the discussion of carbon benefits of wood products and fiber sourcing transparency and the A4 transportation tools. Learning objectives. Hopefully by the end of today, you are going to um, have a better, ex or better idea of how to explain the potential carbon benefits of sustainably managed forests, express the importance of wood products in the health of working forests, describe the forthcoming tools to enhance transpar transparency of forest certification data, to future wood products. Today's panel, First of all, we are going to hear from Ethan Brightley, and then we'll, we will move on to Evie Sonny Hall, and then and Jane Alonso will be presenting. And then um, our, our team here at AWC, Lori Cook is our Director of Educational Outreach, myself, Manager of Education and Accreditation, and our um, behind the scenes powerhouse, Kim Paulson, Education Administrator. Now, without further ado, I am going to send you over to Ethan. All right, thanks so much. Um, so hello, uh, I'm Ethan Breitling. I am the Creative and Communications Director for the National Alliance of Foresters. Uh, I'm excited to speak to you today and I hope that you find this presentation informative and engaging. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, NAFO's membership owns and manages timberland throughout the United States. Our 50 member companies own and manage 47 million acres of private forests in 34 states and 137 congressional districts. So if all of our land uh, was in one spot, it would be larger than the state of Washington. Uh, and if that's hard to wrap your head around, it's about two thirds the size of the United Kingdom. Uh, also our 32 association members represent an estimated 40 million additional acres uh, in states throughout the country. So, you know, NAFO is to the United States as say the Georgia Forestry Association is to Georgia and uh, George, the Georgia Forestry Association, for example, is a member of NAFO. So we've got uh, representation across the country. So we're gonna start today uh, by telling a story about forests, forest products and carbon and some one important clarification before we get going. We're talking about forests in the United States only. Uh, we're gonna talk about a lot of data, but the good news is that the data primarily comes from the Forest Service and the EPA. Uh, the data analysis uh, comes from the National Council on Air and Stream Improvement, otherwise known as NCASI, um, and all of our data is gonna be shown in pictures. Uh, so, it's good news all around. And uh, our story is gonna begin with an overview of our nation's forests. So let's start with perspective. Uh, the total land mass of the United States is about 2.3 billion acres. And of those 65 million acres are forest lands. And these forests are spread across the whole country. You know, most often people think of only Washington or Oregon. Uh, when they think about forestry, but the reality is we are all over the country, as you can see here. Now, if we put all those forests in one spot, it helps us re uh, you know, put in perspective how large they are. It's about one third of the total U.S. land base, 34%. Now, not all forests are the same, and understanding the types of forests and their uses and how we use different forest land is fundamental to understanding 
forests, forest policy, how forests interact with the atmosphere, and you know everything else from a national point of view. So those four forest types are shown here, and we divide forests um, based on some ownership classes and uses. But before we talk about the different types of forests, let's orient ourselves. So take a look at the white box on the bottom left. That's the size of Texas. All of this data is shown proportional. So if we turn our attention back to these squares, we can see the top two boxes are public forest lands, which include federal, state, and locally owned forests. You've probably hiked in one of these forests before. Um, I grew up going hiking in the Adirondack State Park in upstate New York, it's where I first fell in love with forests. Now, the bottom two boxes, those are privately owned forests or those owned by individuals, uh, businesses, tribes. Uh, you've also probably been in these forests too and may not have even known it. A lot of the time, borders are all over the place and you'll be hiking on a trail and you don't realize whose land you're on. So uh, the two boxes on the right are working forests or forests that are managed to produce wood and fiber. Now, working forest is a term that people are often unfamiliar with. A working forest is a forest that can be managed for multiple purposes, but one of those purposes must include wood and fiber production. So the two boxes on the left now that we haven't spoken about yet, those are forests that are managed for purposes other than wood and fiber. MAFO, for whom I work, are privately owned working forests, and those are in the bottom right box. So, if we look at these boxes, we can kind of see some insights. From the first we notice, we can see that 60% of forests in the United States, that's the bottom two boxes you see highlighted here. And this statistic is usually shocking to most people uh, because when most people think forests, they immediately go to national parks. You know, it's just something that the general public is not aware of. But note that national parks would be in the top left-hand box um, not in the, uh, uh, the privately owned boxes that we have highlighted here. So 60% of our forests are privately owned. If we look at working forests alone, it's a different story. We see 70% of all working forests in the United States are privately owned. And these are forests that are working to produce wood and fiber. We're gonna focus much of our story and our discussion today on these private working forests that you can see highlighted in the right-hand side of your screen. So let's talk about harvests. Each year we harvest trees uh, from working forests to produce wood and fiber. That's what makes working forests work. Uh, we harvest less than 2% of our working forests each year. And harvest includes any activity that removes trees from the forest. Now an important clarifying note here is that the available national data that we're basing this data visual does not distinguish between clear cutting, thinning, road construction, or any other type of management. So if a single tree is cut on an acre, it's counted in that 2% figure we're showing here. So don't confuse this with the idea that we're clear cutting 2% of our land each year. So if we look at replanting, each year we also replant or regrow as many acres as we're harvested. We replant, excuse me, we plant more than 1 billion trees a year. In fact, we've gotten so good at replanting that since 1958, since 1958, the total acreage in our country has remained relatively constant. But the total volume of wood growing in our forests has increased by nearly 60%. And most of that growth has occurred on private working forests. Uh, today, we're actually growing 43% more wood than is harvested each year on private working forests, despite consistently high demand for wood. Now, at the same time, this is another really important statistic. So 90% of the timber harvest for wood and fiber in the United States comes from private working forests. And remember this point because we're gonna refer back to this again a little later on. So now, here's a snapshot of the products that private working forests produce, arranged from highest to lowest value. 
highest on top, lowest on the bottom, generally. Now, by harvesting and regrowing only that 2% of our working forests, we're providing 90% of the domestic wood and fiber needed for all of these products that we all use every day. These products are renewable, biodegradable, and sustainable. Uh, the harvest volume categories include, as you can see, veneer, lumber, composite, paper, packaging, post poles and pilings, pellets, and miscellaneous. That miscellaneous category, that's everything from, you know, the famous uh, cellulose to uh, membranes that go in cell phone screens uh, and, and firewood. So that's the catch-all category on the bottom there. Um, I think that this crowd is probably most interested in the lumber and composite products as that's uh, used obviously in construction across the country. Uh, now, these private working forests uh, that we utilize to source all of these products are also at the same time as they're pr producing all of these useful and necessary products are providing clean air, clean water, wildlife habitat and jobs. And frankly, it's one of the greatest economic and environmental success stories in our country. Uh, and and in addition to that, there an online book. We're going to pivot now that we have an orientation on U.S. forest lands. We're going to talk about trees, wood, and carbon. So some housekeeping notes. Uh, the story we're about to walk through together helps us visualize carbon in ways that we can actually understand. You know, carbon is pretty esoteric, uh, but pictures can tell a story that we can all relate to. I mean, we're talking about an invisible process in unfathomably large figures, timescales beyond human comprehension. So we need as much help from pictures as we can get. And that's what we're trying to do here. We tell our story by unitizing carbon in a way that helps us speak that common language. And again, the data that we're about to walk through is all from publicly available sources, mostly the EPA and the Forest Service. And then one other note, this is based on 2018 data because it, is, because it is the most recent complete set of data available. So let's get started. So here's our unit of carbon, a single square. This square is 10 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents, or the amount of carbon produced by about 2.1 million passenger vehicles each year. So what does that look like if we talk about emissions from the United States. Let's put that square using this common language into the broader carbon story. So here we have the industrial emissions of the United States. For me, this is how I think of it. Whenever I have a conversation about climate change, I think of it as, you know, what is the actual impact from our whole country going into the atmosphere each year? So this is the, the, the the, the starting point, really. We've got this unit. Now we're looking at the full picture of U.S. industrial emissions. You know, as you know, as you can see here, we're pumping nearly 6.7 billion metric tons of industrial carbon into the atmosphere. And that's carbon com coming from power plants, manufacturing, tailpipes, and pretty much everything else that you can think of that emits greenhouse gases. So uh, at the same time, each year, our forests are sequestering over 1.5 billion metric tons from car of carbon from the atmosphere. And you can see that in these highlighted green squares on the left. Uh, and this is, of course, the result of growing trees, um, photosynthesis and action, which, of course, we all remember from uh, high school biology. Um, and then if we break down that total gross forest sequestration by forest types, we can see private working forests. Again, these are the privately owned forests that we manage for wood and fiber on the left. The next one over, public working forests. Uh, again, those are our national forests, state forest land, et cetera, um, which are also used for producing wood and fiber. And then we have private non-working forests and public non-working forests subsequently. Uh, note, again, that our private working forests, which as we saw earlier, account for 90% of our timber harvest for wood and fiber, account for nearly three quarters of the total forest carbon sequestration. So if we put this in context, let's, you know, the, we've got the full emissions picture of the United States, we see some uh, sequestration values on screen, but, you know, let's, most 
time uh, you know, talking about vehicles off the road or how many cars there are. So we know that each one of our squares represents about 2.1 million cars, uh, but let's look at some larger, uh, larger data. So we put on screen here, you can see that uh, for context, the growing trees and working forests sequester more carbon than is emitted by passenger vehicles each year. Um, now, there are also industrial emissions from forest management and forest products mills, uh, and here they are. Uh, but note that they're just a small fraction of the carbon sequestered, sequestered each year by our working forests. And uh, one further note on this data, these emissions uh, do not include transportation um, because the publicly available data isn't really good enough yet to show of transportation emissions that would be associated. So, you know, think about log trucks you see rolling down the road. That's not included in these, uh, these figures here. Uh, and that's just because that they're, you know, we're out of sync with a study that needs to be done. Um, so that's just one piece of information that's missing. So um, our forests also emit non-industrial emissions uh, that international protocols put into a separate categories. These are called biogenic emissions because they come from natural sources. For perspective, here are the biogenic emissions from two sources you're probably wondering about, biomass combustion and wildfire. Uh, they are shown here on the top right proportionally, but they are not part of the 6.7 billion metric tons of industrial emissions. Uh, your biogenic emissions versus industrial emissions is one of the most confusing distinctions for most people. I tried to explain this to my dear nephews and uh, failed miserably for about 30 minutes. But what we eventually settled on was this, this oversimplification. Think of industrial emissions as a one-way street with fossil fuels in the ground at the beginning of the street and the atmosphere at the end of the street. Think of biogenic emissions as a two-way street with natural processes on one end and atmosphere on the other. Carbon moves up and down that street. Um, so that's my, my, my best attempt at simplifying biogenic versus industrial emissions as we're going through this. Uh, more questions at the end, happy to help on that. Um, so there are also other types of biogenic emissions um, that help us understand our two-way street metaphor here. Uh, like think about natural processes of growing trees and then versus decaying and old, dying or dead trees. So that is a natural uh, two-way street of, of carbon in a biogenic emission. Uh, we will show you all about biogenic emissions and how they're treated in a moment in terms of counting them. But back to our diagram here, we are talking about sequestration. So talking about sequestration, our forests, in addition to sequestration, also store an enormous amount of carbon. So each year, our carbon sequestered is added to an existing forest carbon storage pool like earnings deposited into a bank account. Our forests store 149 billion metric tons of carbon. That's the worth of emissions from fossil fuel power plants, or 22 years worth of total US industrial emissions. And in fact, it's so large, we can't fit it all on one slide here. So on the left, you can see that's the really long one, that's private working forests, about 54% of the total. Uh, and note again, that left-hand column, the largest storage pool is those private working forests, which are also 75% of our annual gross sequestration and 90% of our wooden fiber. It's coming from that, that green box. So back to biogenic emissions we just talked about. So while tree growth sequesters carbon and increases forest carbon storage, like adding deposits to a bank account, biogenic emissions like burning biomass, wildfires, and decay are reducing storage, like making withdrawals from a bank account. Uh, storage is also reduced each year by timber harvests. Each year we harvest, again, about 2% of our working forest land base, uh, importantly, we also regrow about 2% of our working forest land base. But after all of those removals of biogenic emissions are accounted for, carbon storage in our forest grows by nearly 800 million metric tons each year. On private working forests, that's because, again, each year we grow 
43% more wood than we harvest. So the way I like to describe this is our gross sequestration is our revenue, our biogenic emissions and industrial emissions are our operating costs, and our overall net carbon stock change, what you see here, the uh, net sequestration around 782.4 million metric tons, that's the profit. And that's what we're trying to get, more profit. So that's just the forests. There's even more to the story because when we cut a tree to produce lumber for a house or a building, half of the weight of wood is atmospheric carbon. So each year, new wood products store about 100 million metric tons of carbon. And if we remind ourselves about what these boxes represent, those new wood products represent about 20 million passenger vehicles emissions being locked away in the walls of our homes, uh, the, the desk that my computer is sitting on right now. And this gets added to the 10 billion metric tons of carbon already stored in wood products. And this is more than twice the carbon stored in our national parks. So if we add these together, you start to get a picture of what carbon mitigation through forest products and uh, modern forestry can look like. And so we see the storage pools here and let's build this story that we just walked through together. Here it is in a nutshell. Private working forests and wood products are working and they are a climate solution. Um, they're fundamental to you know, all of the climate success that we're, we're hoping to have as, as a nation. And this diagram that we've walked through is actually part of a uh, scrolling data viz website that it was provided in the materials. Um, so this site here, um, www.forestcarbondataviz.org is a more in-depth, cooler version of what we just walked through. It works best on a desktop because it's big and uh, your mobile phone can't really handle it. Um, but in here, there's a really important section on the top right of the little screen there, you can see little quotes. Um, that is the citations. Also, every single piece of data that you see in the scrolling web page, if you click on the green data, it'll open up and tell you exactly where the data points are coming from. Uh, and there's explainers. Um, it's written in normal human which is pretty great uh, because a lot of the time this stuff. So we encourage uh, everyone to visit the site, poke around on it. Uh, it's, we think it's a really valuable tool. And of course, if you have any questions, we're always happy to help. I hope that this overview of forests and forest carbon was helpful for you all. And at this point, I'll turn it back over to. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, and I'm just gonna do a brief overview and then hand it over to E.D. Sonny Hall, who's um, really the, the technical expert to talk through the projects that we've been working on. Just a bit about me, I am a Denver-based independent consultant, um, but I have worked with the forest uh, product sector for I think over 15 years now. Uh, prior to moving to Denver, I lived in Washington, D.C. and I was actually a colleague of Ethan's. I worked at NAFO, the National Alliance of Forest Owners. I was the Vice President for Government Relations. So um, told the story about um, forests, private working forests for many years. And uh, earlier in my career, I was a staffer on Capitol Hill uh, for about a decade. Um, so I'm also uh, an expert in telling the story to policymakers. Um, so that's a bit about me and I'll let Edie introduce herself when we get to her. So Edie and I have been working together as a team um, this year on some key carbon and sustainability projects. Uh, and what we're trying to do here is really tell the story about um, carbon sequestration in forests and forest products in a much more cohesive way using really good data. And I'm just gonna, let's see. I am trying to toggle. Okay, there we go. Um, so a few words, I think, uh, for context setting about our sector that are, I think are worth mentioning before going forward. So um, many of you already know this, but many of you may not. Uh, our uh, sector is fairly siloed and fragmented in terms of uh, organizations and voices. 
Um, so in, in many countries, you might have one trade association that represents um, forests and all the products that come from those forests and speaks to all different types of audiences. But here in, in the United States, um, we our sectors represented in probably about a dozen different organizations. Um, so Ethan and NAFO are one of those organizations representing large private working force companies. Uh, there are um, family landowners that are represented in other organizations. There are some family landowners that aren't represented by any organizations. Uh, the products in the supply chain are represented by a host of different organizations. Some represent lumber, some represent panels, uh, some represent paper. <laughs> Uh, some of the organizations in our supply chain uh, speak just to federal policymakers. Others speak to state policymakers. Some just speak to customer audiences. So this is just to give you a sense. I'm not going to go through every single one of these organizations, but it's just to give you a sense that um, we don't have one centralized voice that that addresses the entire supply chain. Uh, and what that means is there are some gaps um, in terms of how we're telling the story because the information uh, is in different places and it's not being brought together in one cohesive way where customers and stakeholders that are interested in using wood or quantifying how wood products and forests are storing carbon um, they can just go to one place and sort of find the information they need. Uh, so what Edie and I have been working on on behalf of, we're actually on retainer with the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, is create that will help um, deliver that information in an easy to access way uh, for key audiences. Uh, so this slide just shows a number of the key questions that um, that are being asked out there about wood products. So essentially, you have um, a huge amount of interest in building with wood. Um, Ethan really did a great job kind of laying out how forests can store carbon. We know wood products also store carbon. And so when companies and stakeholders are, are looking at um, carbon sequestration goals, they're really interested in wood and forest products. We also have a huge amount of interest among the audience that's up here on this webinar today, the architect community, the AEC community, in terms of building with wood, because it is a sustainable product. And here are some of the questions that we hear audiences often ask about uh, wood and forest products. So if we use more wood, how do we know the forest will not decrease in size and health? And I think Ethan did a great job kind of showing you that um, greater use <laughs> of wood products is actually not decreased the size and health of a forest in the United States. In fact, it's correlated with an increase actually in the wood um, that's being grown or the, for, the forest fiber that's being grown here in our country. Um, there's questions around trusting that American wood product DVDs will actually tell the complete story uh, about the, for, the forest product from, from the cradle to gate. Uh, are certification systems actually a proxy for measuring carbon benefits? Why don't I see a greater use of whole building LCA assessments? How can I convey the science around carbon storage and wood products to non-technical audiences? Why can't I see into the entire supply chain? If using wood products is a better choice for the climate, how can I report progress against established carbon reduction goals? And then how do you fit in wood products? Uh, and these questions are being asked in particular by audiences that are really interested in using wood in the built environment. So I already mentioned the architect engineering and construction AEC community. There are uh, carbon forums that are, are trying to create standards um, for carbon accounting. So carbon leadership forum is one of them trying to make information accessible to um, the AEC audiences. And then there, there, there are those that are creating standards and tools 
and a great, just a huge amount of interest out there among policymakers and other decision makers in terms of um, how to quantify carbon in the built environment. So there are three overarching questions um, that those kind of sub questions fit into. So one of them is how can we better understand the carbon and environmental impact of growing and using wood products across the full supply chain, the, the full value chain. And I already mentioned that um, the sector is very siloed. So the information is often there. It's just in different pieces and it's um, not always being collated into one place, into one unified story so that people can see across the entire supply chain from the forest all the way through to the end product. Uh, there's also an interest in better understanding how to report and, and measure um, progress against climate goals through the use of forest, forest products. And third, how can we better understand that increase in, if the increase in wood product use will actually impact forests? I'm trying to go, okay. One more slide and then I'm gonna turn it over to Edie. So really what we've kind of honed in on beyond just those, those questions is how can we actually answer these questions in the right way? And what we found are kind of five really places that we wanna focus our efforts. Um, first of all, it's really about creating greater transparency in carbon and sustainability data reporting. The information is 90% of the time it's there. It's just there somewhere and it's not always there um, in, a, in a place that customers uh, or audiences can easily access it. So what we're trying to do is really try to take all that information that's already out there and put it into a place where it is accessible. We're also working on a set of aligned reporting protocols so that um, you where people where companies where users are reporting in a certain way over here that it's aligned with what's going on in other forums and so you essentially have a unified system where everyone is reporting common information in in a way that it's going to speak to audiences across the board uh, centralized data research information that kind of um, supports those first two goals um, easy to access building um, carbon benchmarking data is another one um, that I think is going to be very helpful to the architect community and making sure that standards development is is synced in with all this data research and information that um, that we're going to be pulling and centralizing and making accessible and transparent. Uh, so okay so with that I'm going to turn it over to Edie to um, to really hone in on the details on some of the projects that we're um, initially just looking at to um, to embody all this, all these goals. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Jane, and thank you, Ethan, for giving such a great overview. Um, my name is Edie Sani Hall, and I have been working with Jane um, for the last six months or so on, on these forest to frame projects. I have a background in, um, I have a PhD in forest carbon accounting and life cycle assessment. So I have been living and breathing the biogenic carbon cycle for um, almost 20 years now. But I came into forestry um, just like Ethan actually, growing up hiking in the Adirondack Mountains. Um, my love of forests is what drove me into forestry. And I can tell you that that's really what drives most people into forestry. They like the outdoors and they don't really like people. <laughs> We're kind of introverts. Um, and that has been um, a big downfall for the forest sector for years and years and years because there's all this great information and we can talk about it all day long to ourselves but haven't really done a very good job about talking about it to other people. Um, and so we have been sort of left with this like this 
this this this dichotomy here where we were sort of shaking our heads saying well but we are doing all this stuff and we're managing all these things and 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 it's not getting to the customer and it's not the questions are not being answered in the proper way so this has been an incredible effort to say okay we really want to focus on getting data in a format that people understand and to focus on extreme transparency is what what I like to call it. Um, so having some really great data that that Ethan and the folks at NAFO have been working on on sort of describing the overall processes, I think it's going to be super helpful. Um, and the work that we are trying to do is is trying to get some very concrete discrete projects here um, to deliver information um, to specifically these three projects are, are, are really focused on the, the architect and the engineer community answering some questions they have about using wood in buildings. So um, I'm going to give a brief overview of three projects that are currently underway. Um, they, they are really intended to enhance um, increased forest to mill and then that manufacturing that mill to consumer carbon transparency so jane next slide um for the a4 transportation tool yes okay so the first project is is a pretty simple one you would think um and it's really trying to get at that question of what are the greenhouse gas emissions associated with transporting the material, in this case wood, um, from the manufacturing facility to my building site. Um, this is what is known as the A4 stage in a whole building life cycle assessment. And that's what why this um, title is called the A4 transportation tool. And it, it is simply describing um, that those emissions um, uh, that, that are related to both the distance and also the mode of transportation. So some of it is going by rail, some of it is going by truck, some of it, some of it may be going by boat, but usually domestically we're, we're focused on the, the um, rail and truck. Now, why hasn't this information been compiled before? Well, most material um, product life cycle emphasis has really been placed on that, that product side. Um, so the greenhouse gas emissions focused um, um, associated with transporting logs from the forest to mill, those are included in what's known as a cradle to gate product life cycle assessment. And these are reported to consumers in what is known as environmental product declarations or EPDs, if you've heard those names. So that has been the, the mode of communication to the consumer thus far. But if you, you, we, the world is concerned about reducing total embodied carbon, total building and car bodied carbon emissions, then we're really focused on assessing things at that whole building life cycle stage, um, which means that you are actually be looking at not just what is happening within your material, but your choice of material what your choice of what you are building at. And so that's where you can um, compare different material uses, um, com uh, compare different design formats, et cetera. And with that, you need to be looking at the entire life cycle stage. So not just the project product production from cradle to gate, but also this transportation to the site, the installation, the use, and then the end of life. And so that is what we are focused on right now. Um, now, I will say that in whole building lifecycle tools, um, whole building LCA tools, such as Tally, if you've heard of that, or Athena's Impact e e Estimator, if you in, uh, heard of those, um, there is an A4 transportation stage, but the data is very coarse. They know that they, they don't have specific data relative to, to the materials. So this project is intending to fill that gap and is intending to bring real data associated with providing how wood flows uh, within the US and Canada. Okay, uh, the next project. 
The next project is what's known as the, the, the fiber sourcing transparency tool. So now we're back, back to this product level where are consumers not only interested in sort of the, the carbon piece, and we'll get to that in a second, um, but also want to fundamentally know, we know that wood comes from forests and we all care about forests. And we wanna make sure that, that the wood is coming from a forest that is managed sustainably. Now, across the globe, there are very wide ranges of risks, um, uh, risks to forest management sustainability. Um, and this has been a topic of interest for decades. And there has been a lot of work in creating systems and certifications des designed to address these different risks of sustainability. So this project is intended to elevate and educate these different levels of assurances so that consumers can understand more about where their wood is coming from. Um, and it's a very simple thing. As Jane had mentioned before, a lot of this information is already there. What we are trying to do is collate it in a way that is easy to access for, um, for consumers and also to educate folks that there is a wide range of assurances, especially in, in North America. Um, and we don't necessarily have to have, because of our, our um, uh, vast network of different types of land ownership um, that Ethan mentioned, we've got public lands, we've got small private lands, we have large land landowners. Not everybody is going to go through the process of getting third party certification, which is that highest level of assurances. But there are lots of ways that we can have assurances of the sustainability of the wood that is that is not just that highest level. So I'm going to quickly go through what these tiers are. Um, and this is, uh, these, these categorizations come from a standard, an ASTM standard um, called the categorization of wood fiber according to their sources. So that first level of assurance that you wanna make sure that you have, <laughs> so your wood is, is legal, um, which comes from jurisdictions that have a low risk of le legal activity, um, that you're complying with all of the relevant um, laws and regulations um, from, from your, uh, where your wood is coming from. The good news is that in North America, there are very um, high levels of, uh, of uh, assurances like, uh, on, on legality. And so if you are complying with them, you already have sort of a leg up <laughs> uh, associated relative to the rest of the world. Um, the second level of assurance is what's known as, uh, they call it responsible source of forest products. And this is um, wood fiber that uh, is, is acquired according to either a independently certified procurement standard um, or from a standard of for, or from a state that has um, regulatory forest practices. Um, that implement best management pra practices associated with, with water quality, such as riparian buffers, et cetera. That independently certified procurement standard, um, this is actually done at the mill level. And this is um, done uh, to basically say, hey, I'm going to look at all of the wood coming in. Some of it may be certified, and I'll get to that in a second. Some of it won't, but I need to know where that would come from and that a certain level of assurance um, of, about the management of that of that wood and there are two different um, systems that are in the U.S. that that you can get certified to so the first is the FSC controlled wood um, and they're basically the what they're trying to make sure is that you you don't have wood coming from sort of five main no-nos, um, which are, you know, one is illegal, one is from a high um, conservation value forest to GMO, um, uh, land conversion. Those are kind of those, those main no-nos um, that you've got to assess for a low risk. The other uh, certification system at the mill level is, is the SFI, fiber sourcing standard. And that is actually um, going out and 
making sure through your contract that the, the wood has been harvested, that the best management practices for water quality, so riparian buffers have been enforced, and also that the wood has been harvested with trained loggers. Um, and it's really getting at, at sort of that education on the ground level to make sure that the, the wood is coming um, in a sustainable way. And then this highest tier of fiber sourcing is, is actually sustainably certified forest management practices. They're third party audited. Um, that means that the landowner is um, agreeing to follow a sets of criteria. There's an auditor that comes out that makes sure that this actually happens and then you can get the stamp of approval. And, and these systems, um, there are many different ones. They're sort of dependent on whether you're a small landowner, a large landowner, whether you're uh, global, uh, just North America focused, um, but there are different certification systems there. So uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to just put this in action. Uh, <laughs> pictures are better than the better better than the um, material, uh, and just say that really what the responsible sourcing is focused on that mill side, and then the certified forest. You it's the certification is on the forest side. The mill does need to have a certification. It's called chain of custody to actually show that they have they're 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 pulling through the right quantity um, through their system of how much gets certified. Okay, and next slide, please. So this final example of a project um, is getting back to carbon stocks and what they're doing on a landscape from where your wood is sourced from. So Ethan gave an awesome overview of the carbon dynamics at a national scale. It's important to understand that in any given acre, trees can either be growing slow, they can be growing fast, they can be impacted by insect and disease and fire or harvested and turned into either short or long lived products. So looking at just a stand is not very helpful. Um, you wanna be looking at a, a change in carbon on a scale that's meaningful to that wood fiber supply. And that helps you learn a little bit more about climate impact. Now, the other this is um, also, Ethan did a fa fantastic job in describing this, is that this forest and atmosphere relation is a two-way street. So you're, you're always gonna be going in and out <laughs> and you're also going in and out, not just due to human impacts such as harvest, but also due to nature. Um, and that, so that net car carbon balance in any given year is um, not necessarily indicative of what's gonna happen in the future. Um, and so, it it is good and i think this is like our, our sort of in the past we've said hey let's not give you an actual number because it's not going to be meaningful um i think what we're we are hoping to do is to say let's let's give the number and let's educate the number <laughs> educate folks that that number is just a starting point to understand a little bit more about that area um, and that number should be looked at uh, for the whole such as other ecosystem metrics water quality wildlife as as well as forest health and resiliency so the bottom line with all of this is that there's a wealth of information and science that we are hoping to bring to you in formats that you understand and to educate you about the wonderful complexity of forests and forest products. And with that, I think we'll open it up for um, any, or any of us. I think that's my understanding is that this ends our formal presentation. Yeah, hi, this is Lori. Uh, first, thank you to all three of you. That was very informative and really well presented. So um, we do have a 
few questions that have come in, so we'll jump into those. Uh, the first one I have here is for Ethan, uh, and it's related to uh, wood products in the, the uh, data visualization tool. So I know we talked about them a little bit and um, how they, they can be used as a carbon sink. Um, is there any uh, um, additional information that, that uh, you know, our, our attendees being, you know, primarily from a building design background um, that's geared towards wood building products that would uh, kind of expand on what you presented today, or are there any um, possibilities for future tools that, that might be available that might be useful for them? It's like the audience has read our minds. Uh, actually, our next uh, adventure, uh, NAPO, we are exploring exactly that with AWC. Um, so, you know, we, as uh, the National Alliance of Forest Owners, uh, we worked uh, to pull together uh, this publicly available data on uh, forests to create uh, the data visualization website that you've all seen. Um, but we're looking to the future and uh, wood products is the first thing that we're, we're trying to explore right now. Um, data is, as Edie and Jane pointed out, is uh, uh, more, it's more complicated. Um, and so we're, we're work, working on that now, but uh, there are uh, some links. If you go to the website in the forest product section, there are some uh, expanded links in there, um, but we are looking at our options. And so, yes, in the future, we hope to have uh, an addition uh, all about wood products as to what I presented today. Awesome. All right. Uh, this next question, um, I think maybe it's probably geared towards uh, Jane and Edie a little bit more. But Ethan, if you have anything you wanted to share on it, we certainly wouldn't want to stop you. But uh, this is for um, designers that are attempting to you know, make a decision on what type of building product um, or building system perhaps they might be using. Uh, and uh, there, there's, uh, the question is, what kind of resources uh, or statistics or data might uh, a designer want to use when they are trying to decide uh, on, a, on a product uh, based on its environmental um, impacts. Yeah, I can take that. Um, and first, that's a great question. Um, the, the embodied carbon in buildings is actually a really significant um, piece that, that we have the ability to sort of impact that climate, um, that climate change piece of it right now. Um, and I guess, you know, over the course of the next 30 years, we're going to be doubling the amount of buildings that are <laughs> of the existing building stock. So, so material choice and embodied carbon and design is, is, is going to play a really important role. So the, the, the long answer is that um, we are very much working to scale up the accessibility of whole body building LCAs um, and make it in a way that is easy for um, architects and engineers to do so that they can play around with designs and that that actually it's it's just kind of done on a regular basis so that you, that you are you're looking at your embodied carbon and you're constantly figuring out how you can change that relative to your building type right now um, there are whole building LCA tools that are available um, the one that is free um, is uh, Athena's impact estimator um, I can try to find a a link to that, um, but it's it's fairly user friendly, and they're doing a lot of improvements to to make it even more uh, user friendly. There are also other whole building LCAs such as Tally and One Click, um, and they also are trying to um, make improvements as those in those as well. So I would I would explore those um, and see if you can get some data on those. Um, 
this next question uh, is uh, for Ethan again. Uh, a question related to how uh, land use was categorized in the, uh, the uh, carbon data tool. Um, if we have land that's inside of a national forest and that is leased uh, for uh, you know lumber production or, or something, um, how would that land be categorized? Is that still treated as national forest land? So uh, is it based on the owner or is it based more on the user? That is a good question. It is based on the, um, uh, what's the best way to say this? It uh, it's based on the potential. So there are the forest inventory and analysis program which is administered by the Forest Service is it's essentially, you know, the, the best nation level uh, forest data resource globally. Um, so what they do uh, nationwide, they, they have plots all over um, these are 9000 plots. Maybe it's maybe more than that. They create uh, analysis based off of that. But what they do is they categorize forests in terms of working and non-working by three categories. One, it is timberland that is managed for, it is a working forest that is managed for wood and fiber production. Uh, two, it is not managed for wood and production. So it is like a preserve, you know, it's Yosemite. Um, and then the third category is it's not timber right now, but it could be. So that third category is that it's not timber right now, but it could be. Uh, it's not a working forest right now, but it could be. Timberland and working forest are generally interchangeable terms. So that third category gets combined with the first category to equal our total working forest acreage. Since we don't know exactly when or whether or not a acre could be managed for wood, uh, we have to assume that it could be when we're when we're making these uh, nationwide assessments. Uh, so, for the specific question of in a national forest, um, could that acre that is potentially uh, slated for harvest uh, be considered uh, that uh, a working forest? It would be. Now, it's an important distinction that national parks are different from national forests. Um, there are about I mean, uh, Jane and, uh, and Edie could probably answer this better than I could, but there are about, what, 80 million different categories of land in the uh, public sector? Um, so, uh, so a national forest could have uh, working forest lands, and whether they are specifically working forest lands or questionably, they could be working forest lands, but there hasn't been one in, say, a number of years, that would all be counted as working forests. Uh, but that one would be public working forests, separate from what NAPO right. does, which is private working forests. That's, that was a great answer. It's, it's a, a important distinction, um, but it you know can seem small, but it certainly is important. Um, I think we have time for about one more question. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's a good question. Um, uh, when we're talking about FSC and SFI, uh, when specifying a certification for wood products, should both be stated? Should we specify one or the other? Um, is, is one better than the other? Um, and I, I think maybe um, Edie and, and Jane might, you want to start, and then Ethan, you could chime in again as well <laughs> yeah in in 30 seconds the answer is uh, <laughs> no i think uh, the certifications they they started for for different purposes fsc was started to 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 have make sure that in places where there was no um no governance and laws, et cetera, that there was a way to actually have wood that could be come out of those those countries. 
um, in a responsible way. Um, and it is it is adapted great to the US and other places. SFI is only for North America and it's designed to work within those systems. There's also the American tree farm system, which um, is designed specifically for small landowners that falls under the PEFC um, uh, umbrella, which is the global um, standard. Uh, the bottom line is, all those certifications are 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 good, and I think you should you should specify all of them. Um, you can also look at responsible sourcing, and happy to talk further about it. Excellent. That was a very good short answer to a what could have been a very long answer for a question. Um, all right, I think we are, we're right at the top of the hour here. This concludes uh, the Institute, uh, American Institute of Architects Continuing Education Systems course and, and the AWC course.